the introduction and hopefully everyone can hear me well. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for uh, taking our time to attend this session. Uh, I know everyone's had a very good lunch out there, so I'll try my uh, best to keep everyone awake and interested for the next 60 minutes. Okay. Um, this session, as it is called, Analytical Decision Making Using At Risk and the Decision Tools is based on our software. So at Palisade, we are a software publisher, and I'll demonstrate how we can use our software tools in um, business decision making. Before we jump into the software demonstration, where I can show you how the tools work and how you apply them in, dif in different kind of decision making problems. I thought it's good to do a quick introduction to um, the company. To begin with, um, I've already been introduced but I have a slide on myself um, as well. So my name is Aman and I've been working with Palisade for the last five years. I joined them in um, October 2012. Um, my key role at Palisade is sales and business development. I look after different regions. So I manage sales in India, which is my home country. I look after sales in parts of UK and Europe. Okay, so these days you have to say UK and Europe differently for obvious reasons. Um, and I also look after sales in East Asia. My background is in engineering and post-graduation in finance. So this is where I uh, picked up um, this software and um, started working for the company at some point. A bit about Palisade. So Palisade is an American software company. It's been going for about 35 years. It was launched in 1984. The Headquarters of the company are in Ithaca, New York, and then we have some offices around the world, like I'm based at the London office, which looks after sales in this part of the world, Sydney looks after Australia, we looks after South America, we have a presence in Tokyo, and with these five offices, we sell the software in more than 100 countries every year. The software itself comes in about eight different languages, like other than English, Chinese, Spanish, German, Japanese, and so on. We estimate there are about 200,000 uh, or more customers worldwide by now. Our software is used across industries. It is not specific to, say, management consulting or finance or insurance. So if we look at a sample of Fortune 100 companies, 93% of them are using our software. Or if we look at Fortune 500 companies, more than 75% of them are using Palisade software. And other than the businesses using the software for risk and decision analysis and business decision making, it's also taught at more than 800 academic institutions worldwide. So it's used in, at the postgraduate level mostly in course in subjects like decision sciences, quantitative techniques, risk management, um, financial modeling and so on. Okay. I'll tell you more about the software now. Okay, so our offering is called the Decision Tools Suite. This is a bundle of eight applications, all of which plug into Excel and help you with risk and decision analysis. At Risk is our flagship tool. That's the one that launched the company 35 years ago and is used for Monte Carlo simulations. Monte Carlo simulations is a scientific approach to modeling uncertain inputs with the distribution and then creating scenarios to uh, quantify risk in uncertain outcomes. Evolver and Risk Optimizer also brings scenario analysis techniques to Excel. So when you have a range of scenarios that are under your control, but you want to find out that one specific scenario which will maximize your output, minimize it, or bring it to some kind of a target range, this is where Evolver and Risk Optimizer help you. We have a bit of focus on statistics as well. So Stat Tools is a tool for pure statistical analysis within Excel. Um, if I were to, there are lots of applications for statistical analysis um, these days, but in terms of functionality, you could compare it to something like Minitab. So Stat Tools has introduces, rewrites Excel's functions of statistics, plus introduces some advanced functions in regression like logistic regression, discriminant analysis, non-parametric testing, time series forecasting, and so on. Neural Tools is a very interesting package for neural networks. So when you want to get into a bit of predictive analytics and you want to study patterns in historic data using brain mimicking techniques, so this is what Neural Tools can do for you in Excel. Uh, moving on, some people look at strategic decision making which is when they want to draw decision tree diagrams and they use decision tree as a tool for that. 
Top rank is a very simple tool for doing what if analysis on any kind of model. And Big Picture is our newest offering, which is a tool for mind mapping and data exploration. So if you have a lot of data and you want to create a visual summary of the data, you don't want to analyze it statistically and find the mean, just want some kind of a visual representation of data, this is where you use Big Picture. So that's our offering of tools. And all these tools plug into Excel. They have a separate menu bar, uh, everything. They're very easy and intuitive to use. And uh, I'll now move on to demonstrating of what some of these tools do. Okay. Um, a couple of more slides. Um, these are, I mentioned that software is used across industries. So this is a snapshot of why some of the industries are using our software. Like why is it used in finance? Why is it used in manufacturing for applications in Six Sigma and quality analysis? I'll not read through all of them. This is a snapshot of who some of our customers are. This is just to kind of emphasize they come from every industry. So we could be looking at automobile, banking, manufacturing, management consulting, analytical firms, insurance companies, oil and gas companies. I mentioned about 800 academic institutions using the software. So a couple of slides in India now. So I've only fitted in like eight, four IITs, but there are more IITs using the software on the engineering side of the discipline and the management consulting side. It's very popular at IIMs. About eight IIMs use our software in their courses. We're in Bangalore, and Bangalore has been a customer for us for a long time. <coughs> in terms of other B schools like ISP, Hyderabad, I've run into many people who have used our software back at ISP and have come and said hello to me and say, we remember working with at risk. There are more management schools like SP Jan and so on. These are some customers in India. Again, across different industries, construction people in construction engineering, people in management consulting, oil and gas companies, financial services companies, pharma companies, IT software, etc. So there's been a wide adoption of these tools over the last 10, 15 years since we've been active in this market. So with this, we can now move on to the software demonstration bit. So I'm going to uh, move out of this and. I'm going to launch the software. We'll begin with At Risk. This is the tool which I mentioned is used for Monte Carlo simulations. So launching the tool launches Excel for me. And if you see, it's put on a new ribbon bar in Excel. Okay, so this is the At Risk ribbon bar. What this ribbon bar does is, it gives Excel some more statistical capability which it originally does not have. So for example, just like you can type any formula, so all our functions begin with the prefix risk. So this is the library of functions that Excel now recognizes and um, when, I, when we work with these functions, it will be able to uh, give us the results we want. So as I said, the tool is for Monte Carlo simulations. So at the um, heart of Monte Carlo simulations, you have the concept of defining an uncertain assumption using a probability distribution. So you think of an uncertain assumption, say, um, I want to drive from here to the airport. So the distance to drive into the airport is fixed. It's about 30 odd kilometers, but the time taken is not fixed. This can vary, you know, depending on traffic conditions or uh, any kind of other incidents along the way. So if you work with Excel and you say, now put in a scenario, what will happen? And you can only put in one scenario in a single cell. So you might take, okay, the best average case is about 75. So 75 minutes is what I'll represent in this cell that it takes me to drive to the airport. But we can represent more scenarios in the single cell by defining it as a distribution instead. So we have a library of distributions you can choose from. Um, there are about 75 plus. And I could go out here and say, maybe I'll choose a bell curve distribution which is bounded, like the third distribution, and say, okay, my most likely scenario is 75. Great. So what's the minimum it can take? And you think about it, there isn't much of a downside. It, the best you know I can do is about 60 minutes. But how about the worst case? So anyone would like to recommend a worst case for Bangalore traffic to get to the airport? Maybe 120, if I'm not being too pessimistic. So now I'm able to put a distribution on a range of possible scenarios. So I'm not sure which scenario will happen. And I'm not saying it will either be 60, 75, or 120. It could be any scenario in between as well. So when I click OK, I put in a risk PERT function in this cell. 
and this helps me now create scenarios. So I press F9 and maybe I took 89 minutes. I took 79 minutes, I took 71, 86, 87, 77. So that's the key functionality. Now I can represent a range of scenarios on a single input cell and I can do that on a structured model and simulate the model, simulate the outcome, the possible outcomes of the model. So to put it to some kind of business use now, I'll go to some example spreadsheets and we'll look at a couple of examples. So I'm just going to pick up one of the example models from here. Um, okay, so let's look at this example model. Okay, so say this is some kind of a basic model you have made in Excel and you have some costs which are given like cost per label this is not uncertain you know the cost per label you know the cost per labor of per hour testing so these are some assumptions you are working with you've made out a model uh, you've structured out a model for manufacturing five products model one to five and um, you can decide how much testing you want to do based on all these uh, linkages you have worked out what your total profit is. So you've interlinked all your assumptions, which is what you call a model, worked out your revenue, deducted your costs, and arrived at a total profit, okay? Now, this total profit is going to depend upon demand. So as of now, you are representing demand as a single number. Only if this demand happens, will your total profit be about 2.16 million. If any other scenario happens, the, your, your total profit will change. So what you want to do is you want to represent this into a distribution just like we did on the other cell. And this is exactly what's been already done in the model. So we have taken a triangular distribution and represented this on demand. So we're saying demand estimate is 1500. It could be about 1275 units. It could be about 1800 units. Similarly, I have another distribution on model two. And this is between 1125 and 1440 and so on. So now when I, let's kind of zoom out a bit, okay, so now when I press F9, I can generate those random scenarios. I can say, what if this demand happens, my profit is lower. What if this demand happens, my profit is higher. What if this demand happens, my profit is something else. So now I can test this model and say, I will generate say 10,000 scenarios of the blue cells. I go to all the blue cells, take a diagram sample, that's one iteration. I do this 10,000 times and I see 10,000 possible outcomes for my total profit. So all I do is click on start simulation and at risk is generating all these scenarios for us. We'll look at the results in a minute. Just to show you what it did in a couple of seconds was it generated these scenarios. So this was the first set of assumptions and this was your total profit. This was the second set of assumptions this was your total profit and now we have 10,000 such possible outcomes but we are not going to look at 10,000 outcomes individually all we want to do is we want to look at the statistical summary so if we go to the browse results we can see a distribution of total profit so it shows you the minimum total profit we got out of the 10,000 iterations is about 1.97 million the best case was about 2.1 million. So you have a range that you are now realistically working with. That's the extreme of course, but now we can go to the histogram and ask any kind of question you want. So you might say, what's the probability it will be less than 2 million? There's only a 0.1% chance it will be less than 2 million. How about 2.05 million? there is a 3% chance it will be less than 2.05 million. Or you might say, okay, forget the downside, our management want to have at least 2.1 million. And you can say, well, we have a 67% chance we can achieve 2.17 million. So these are the types of questions. This is how you, this is now you have formally or in a scientific way quantified your risk on this model. It's not a gut feeling anymore. It's not a judgment bias. You've worked with distributions, you've taken enough scenarios and you can now 
calculate the probability of any scenario you want. So that's a quick demonstration of how you put at risk to work for business decision making. A couple of other things that this software will tell you or the analysis will tell you is for example a tornado diagram. A tornado diagram will rank your inputs by the effect they have on the output. So in this case you had five assumptions, um, five uncertain inputs in the model but you could have five, fifty, five hundred, n number of assumptions and if you knew what the top ten critical assumptions are in your model which are driving more risk into your output that makes it more intuitive for you then. So for example in this case there is more the uncertainty of uh, the demand in model three is driving more risk compared to demand to model 2 and 5. So now I know where the uncertainty lies. So with this information if I want to say maybe we focus more on advertising model 3 than compared to model 2 and so on. So these are the kind of strategies that you can now you know build upon by analyzing the model. Um, a couple of other things you can do are you can also int correlate input assumptions. So when I say that I mean we ran different scenarios on model 1, model 2, model 3 but they were not interrelated. They did not have any kind of dependency in between them. So to demonstrate that if I look at the input, so the blue curve is what I defined. The red histogram is all the samples I took were from the full curve. And if I overlay these samples with the ones on model 2, I should see the correlation is 0. The correlation is 0 between model 1 and model 2 demand because I never defined a correlation. But I can change that now. I can make this problem more interesting and say model 1 and model 2 have a correlation. So the more f demand for model 1, the more demand for model 2. So all I do is go to define correlation matrix and say okay this correlation is going to be positive. It can be a number between minus 1 to plus 1 and I'll set this at 0.6. Okay, so we'll set it at 0.6. Click OK and we can have a location for the matrix which can be here. So similarly I could have more correlations. I could correlate model 4 and 5 to have some kind of a negative correlation. So I go back and I say, okay, these guys have a negative correlation of 0.6, okay, and I can put it here. So now I'm playing with the interlinkages between demand. So now I have to generate a new set of scenarios. I can do that. So I click start simulation again and I generate a new set of scenarios. Now to demonstrate that we captured that interdependency, if I correlate samples of model 1 with model 2, I can see I captured that dependency. The correlations between model 1 and model 2 is now 0.6. So I was able to capture that dependency between assumptions. Similarly, if I correlate assumptions of model 4 with model 5, this should be a negative correlation of 0.6. So I captured that dependency. Now this makes your simulation more realistic. This could also change any kind of results you looked at earlier. So for example, now the tornado chart has turned upside down. It's not model 5 which is driving more risk into the model. It's more of model 1. And if I go back to the distribution, um, the probability of you know kind of making a profit or a loss kind of would have changed depending on the size of the model and depending on the correlations we defined between the inputs. Um, so, so that's an introduction to at risk in terms of how you the model is yours of course you know so we're not providing you with a model we're providing you with a set of functions which you will overlay on top of your model. The first step is you will find inputs which are uncertain and go and define uncertainty on them. You will identify outputs which you are interested in tracking and add them as an output. If inputs have any kind of dependency between them then you define a correlation. You hit the start simulation button and you generate the scenarios you're looking for and the browse results then you analyze your results. And that's 
you know, a quick overview of Monte Carlo simulation. A couple of other things you can do with at risk car. You can also do some time series analysis. So time series we're looking at not random scenarios, we're looking at scenarios in the future which are uncertain, but those scenarios are following some kind of a trend. The, um, so what happens in the past would influence future values. When we were doing uh, random sampling for a distribution, this was not the case. We were not working with that kind of uh, assumption. So for example, if I roll a die five times and I get different numbers, two, four, six, three, two, this does not influence what will my sixth outcome be when I roll the die the sixth time or the seventh time. They have no dependency in between each other. So when that's the kind of uncertainty you work with, probability distributions are the answer. But if you were working with say currency or stock prices or commodity prices, then what's happening in the past is going to influence what's going to happen in the future. And this is where time series functions come in. So with at risk, you have a capability to define about 10 different time series processes as well. If you're familiar with them, some of them are called moving average or geometric Brownian motion or Brownian motion mean reverting models and so on. So to show you an example, we'll look at a time series application. Um, so let's look at portfolio optimization. So for example, I've got stock prices of different stocks, Apple, Cisco, HP, IBM, etc. And uh, I don't want to put a distribution to them because I can see, okay, Apple stock price was 7 and by the end of the data it was about 182. So there's no point putting a distribution and saying next month's stock price will automatically be something like 50 and then again it will be 7. That's not going to happen. But I can fit it to a time series process. So for that I can use the time series fit functionality. I select the data out. The data is from D5 to D64. This is a trend line for the stock price. Mean and variance are not stationary. So I want to uh, do some kind of transformation on them before I can fit them to a time series process. And these are all the time series processes that are available. So when I say fit, at risk finds for me the time series process which fits best on this. So for example, it is recommending you go with the moving average one. In a moving average, you're trying to imply that the average tends to go up. So a moving average model will fit well in on a uh, data like this. The blue line is the historic path and it is telling you what possible paths this can take. So for example, the black line is the expected mean. The gray shaded area, the darker one, is the 50% confidence. The lighter area is the 90% confidence and the red line is just one sample path. And I can simulate the sample path now. So if you see the red line is moving along. So this could, these are a possible sample paths that this stock price can take. So if I wanted to write that to a cell, all I do is say, okay, I want to forecast values for the next 12 months. And these are my forecasted values and I can generate sample paths that this stock price can take over the next 12 months and if I put it into a model now I'll be able to simulate these assumptions as well. So this is where uh, the time series functionality is a very mathematical and quantitative technique but again we bring it to Excel with easy to use functions. So if you have data you can simply go and fit in the time series model. If you know how to define a time series model you can begin from scratch and define these parameters just like you define a distribution and simulate a time series process as well. So that's on at risk. Uh, we do have questions towards the end which I'll be happy to take but if you have any questions now on at risk I'll be happy to take before I introduce you to some more techniques in scenario analysis. Okay. Yes, sir. Just one. Regarding the Monte Carlo simulation, you showed us how you actually factored in some of the variables that and dimensions that you knew about. Yes. With different risks. But what about those that we do not know about? So you mean inputs which you know about 
but you don't know the uncertainty. Okay, so there are there's a concept of you know known unknowns. So there are ten variables. You know them, but they are unknown. They are, you, their values are not known for sure, but you can still estimate what their range can be. Then there is also a concept of unknown unknowns. So there is a tenth, eleventh variable which you don't know about. So it's not in your model. So there is nothing you can do about it till the day comes and you find that find about it. Okay. Okay, so this was scenario analysis using Monte Carlo simulation. Now I'll introduce you to another application which is also about scenario analysis, but it is not random scenario analysis. Okay, it is called Evolver, and this brings in the concept of optimization. Okay, so let's close this. Oh, sorry, I closed the entire file. Let me just launch it again. Okay, so I'll load in Evolver again. Okay, so this is the Evolver ribbon bar. Evolver is an optimization tool and it is an enhanced version of solver so if any of you have done any